space. So LSCG is very proud to partner with African Development Bank to host this event, and we want to thank all the organizers of the African Pavilion for their hospitality and support. Um, just very quickly about London Stock Exchange Group, we sit at the heart of global financial markets and play a leading role with the entire market around creating the financial architecture that supports the acceleration of a just transition to net zero, uh, growing the green and sustainable economy, and creating inclusive economic opportunity for all. So just very briefly about the session outline. So yesterday we heard some very, very impassioned remarks from heads of state who have focused on the profound effects of climate change uh, across their countries and territories. And ultimately, we know that there's a very big issue, particularly in Africa, around financing the opportunities for growth and development of renewable energy um, power capacity. So one of the things that the LSC has been doing over the last few years, the last two years, in fact, is focusing specifically on how to finance that energy transition gap across Africa. IRENA have estimated that gap as being about $100 billion per year for the next 10 years to hit net zero by 2050 and for Africa to meet its NDCs. We know that 600 million Africans currently don't have access to grid power. And we know that African industry in particular and commerce is short of reliable, renewable power, which is slowing down major initiatives like the Africa Continental Free, Free Trade Agreement, which is seeking to build that circular economy across Africa. And probably even more importantly and existentially, Africa's population is, as we know, due to grow to 2.5 billion, 30% of the world's population, which may well rely on carbon uh, high carbon fuels and infrastructure in order to meet that energy demand. So what are we doing about focusing on increasing renewable energy capacity? So to discuss these issues and challenges and opportunities today, um, I have a excellent esteemed panel of veritable experts and I'd just like to introduce them um, in order here. We are absolutely delighted to have Mr. Rami El Dukhani, who is the chairman of EGX, the Egyptian Stock Exchange. Uh, prior to his role at EGX, Rami was the Secretary General of the Arab Federation of Capital Markets. Rami was named as among the top 40 of those under 40 by the Middle East Policy Council in Washington. He's had more than 19 years of experience in the field of investment banking, corporate finance, strategic planning. Please show your appreciation for Mr. Rami this morning. Next to Rami is Greg Murray. Uh, Greg is the CEO and co-founder of Coco Networks. It's a technology platform that has over 700,000 households on its clean fuel and carbon platform including over 30% of all of Nairobi's homes. So Coco employs 1,500 people across Africa and East, uh, East Africa and India, and they operate a renewable fuels utility supplying mass market households with ultra clean fuel, which is replacing the demand for charcoal based cooking fuel. Please show your appreciation for, for Greg. Thank you. Next to Greg is uh, my co-host, effectively, um, Wale Shonibari, who is the Director for Energy Financial Solutions and Policy Regulation at the African Development Bank. He's also a non-exec director of the board of the Africa Guarantee Fund and an advisory board member in the Nigerian Infrastructure Debt Fund and Inspired Evolution Investment Management, respectively. Prior to joining AFDB, while he held various senior management level positions across investment banks and consulting organizations across the UK, the UAE, and Nigeria. Please, for Wale. Thank you. And finally, least but not least, I have the pleasure of, uh, all the way from New York, um, introducing Mr. Mark Gallagher. Uh, Mark is the co-founder and managing principal of Free Cairns Group. 
Three Cairns is a mission-driven investment and philanthropic firm which builds support and uh, builds and supports innovation of organizations and incentives to accelerate climate action. Mark co-founded Centerbridge Partners in 2005, which was, and he was previously the head of global private equity at Blackstone and served as an expert senior advisor to climate, sec, uh, climate envoy John Kerry early in the Biden administration. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. So, we're going to kick off. We're a little behind on time, so we're going to try and speed things up and catch up as quickly as possible. And I really wanted to focus again on these challenges and opportunities for financing the energy gap across Africa. And I want to focus, first of all, on the challenges. So I'm going to ask the panel on what they think the biggest challenges facing African countries in their pursuit of finance for renewable energy projects across the continent. So Mark, I'm going to start with you, if I may, on that first specific question. If you can have him a mic, that would be great. There are many people on the panel who know more about Africa than I do. I know a good amount about finance, so I'm going to focus my comments on finance. Uh, I think of the major challenge that I see is on uh, the earliest stage of projects, who wants to have, what should I be doing that would lessen that? Anything? No, just keep talking. Okay. So, the earliest stage of a project requires someone who wants to own risk. Right now, the world is structured so that the parties who want to own risk don't really want to come to Africa. What do we do about that? I'll let others talk about political economy or human capital, and I'll just talk again just about on finance. I think the things that we need to do is identify those parties who want the earliest possible risk and then encourage them to come to Africa. For three Karens, that means that we're looking at establishing and are in the process of establishing a global fund that would focus exclusively on early stage project development. This fund would be philanthropic, so the lowest capital in the structure, the riskiest capital, would be from philanthropy. The dollars above that would be from governments or DFIs. That capital would be used to begin projects in partnership with local partners. Once a project is in a position to uh, be built, you'd cycle out of the project and then go do it again. Over time, philanthropy should not have to play this role. It doesn't really make sense. To do it at scale, you need governments, you need the private sector more broadly, but today I think you need greater level of solutions, and those solutions need to come from differentiated types of capital structure. I'm going to stop talking because the fly likes the person who's speaking. Thank you, Mark. And um, we'll come back to you to hear a little bit more about uh, how the, the fund works in particular, but thank you very much for those opening comments. Wally, can I move on to you? Um, same question. What are the biggest challenges that African governments are finding right now in terms of accessing capital. Um, thank you very much, Ibukun. I think one of the key things that we have to address is the fact that if we're going to finance African infrastructure, African utilities, we collect revenues in local currency and we're financing in hard currency. It's very important that we develop local African capital markets, we increase savings, because every time you go and borrow in dollars to finance your infrastructure, you're relying on the savings of others. You're relying on the savings of the Americans, of the British. We cannot continue. I don't know of any example of any country that has developed its infrastructure on foreign investment. It has to be local investment. It has to be the savings of workers in those countries. And large economies, have to be able to finance the infrastructure in local currency. When you had the Asian crisis in 
1997, one of the reforms that the Asians put in place was to develop their sukuk markets, their local currency financing. We have to do that in Africa. When you go to India, you finance in rupees. When you go to uh, China, you finance in renminbi. And we're seeing that in South Africa, you finance in rand. So we have to identify economies in Africa where we have to deepen local savings. The savings rate in Africa countries is very low compared to Asia. And from deepening local savings, we have to reduce capital flight and we have to create the instruments that allow us to be able to finance in local currency. Then specifically to the energy sector, a big issue is about the state of our utilities. You know, the utilities are literally bankrupt. You know, so the utilities are the off-takers. When you invite foreign investors, somebody has to buy the power. If the person or institutions that are buying the power is not credit worthy, then these uh, institutions are going to ask for guarantees. There's a limit to the amount of guarantees that African countries can sign. These countries are reaching their debt sustainability limits. We have to create avenues that will allow us to structure projects that will not require sovereign guarantees because that affects their ability to, to borrow and financial sustainability is a real issue. And on the issue of regulations, we have to put in place regulations that mean that the sector actually makes sense. The sector has to be liquid along the entire value chain from generation to transmission all the way to distribution. People have to pay their electricity bill and if you give people good service, there's a willingness to pay and there's an ability to pay in some cases. In other cases, there's an affordability issue and you have to decide how you're going to get electricity to people, whether it's going to be on-grid or off-grid or solar home systems. You have to identify your customers and you have to be able to identify price points that they can afford. So when the sector makes sense, investors will naturally come because Inve uh, investment follows the path of re least resistance. So these are some of the issues that we have to deal with. Create the right instruments as much as possible, increase local savings, have our pension funds, insurance companies involved, finance in local currency, long-term instruments, and also have the policies and regulations in place to drive investment. Thank you. Well, I think that's a really comprehensive overview there. And I think what I'm hearing there is that there are numerous risks across the entire value chain uh, which are creating these issues. But I like the way that you actually alluded to one or two of the solutions there. And we'll come back to some of those, Wally, as we go along. But thank you very much for that. Rami, can I turn to you, um, Chairman of EGX, facilitator of capital across the region, the capital markets have a huge part to play in terms of financing this energy gap. What are some of those challenges or opportunities at this stage that you're, you're seeing most from an Egypt and North Africa perspective? Well, first of all, uh, the power sector in Africa and in most countries in North Africa is not commercial yet. Many projects do not have the commercial feasibility due to Tariffs are being superly subsidized by many governments. That's when a new investor like a fund here would like to invest into a solar uh, power plant or a wind farm. It is not commercial because at the end of the day, they're paying more expensive. The tariff will be turning out more expensive than conventional power uh, plants. It is key for any public markets to have a proper commercial business case that would allow access to finance as long as we do not have a commercial case. It will always be a problematic situation for donors, funders, uh, everyone, even capital markets, to create appropriate channels for that. So the first step that we need to do is to ensure that tariffs are put properly in place that actually reflects the cost structure of the business. The second thing, I second my colleague here, he said about the, the off-takers are usually bankrupt. So PPAs has to be put in place and it does, the plants itself as an SPV should always, be, uh, should always be far from any subsidy structure. So if any subsidy structure has to go on the government's budget itself, not on the SPV that is actually generating the power in order to create better financial solutions uh, for it. Again, most of the problems in African countries being that the biggest portion of the populations are off-grid 
Thus, you have to invest into transmission projects. Thus, transmission is uh, yeah, yeah, one area that is quite problematic for most of the countries. It's not only the generation. Generation could, solve, could be solved easily, but transmission will be the biggest problem in most of the countries. Thus, we need to start uh, approaching microfinance solutions for smaller households and local communities in Africa in a different perspective to allow them to allow households to bring their own solar panels on their rooftops in order to and not only solar panels maybe in Africa biomass and waste to energy projects could also be an interesting play for them so we need to always to commercialize the business itself in order to have appropriate access to finance that's the challenge I see thank you Rami um, again I think those points are very, very poignant and, and again, very specific to Africa. Um, so again, Rami, thank you very much for that initial view. I understand that we may well have one of our additional panelists who's joining us online. So I'm just going to cue that up for um, Matuma Marangu to come in shortly. But before Matuma comes in, I'm going to actually turn to Greg. Um, and Greg, you're a you're on the ground. You're a project developer across Africa, very successfully across East Africa. You have a slightly different view of these challenges. You've raised money. Um, can you give us your perspective on what you've found your particular challenge to be and more widely within the sector that you represent? Sure, thanks. Um, I think the, the, the biggest challenge um, that we have to keep in mind around energy infrastructure as we're rolling it out it, it, it is the affordability gap. You know, wealthy nations are uh, energy infrastructure welfare states, right? The cooking and heating infrastructure that was built in the UK, uh, America, Australia, where I'm from, was entirely government funded pre privatization of utilities. You know, the pipes that go into people's homes to carry gas was a giveaway from the government. They're all giveaways. Right? Pre-privatization, people forget history. And yet we expect in Africa it all to be commercially financed because, you know, because there is the affordability gap, because there is the, the problem of the tax base being insufficient to fund the giveaway infrastructure that wealthy nations have uh, relied upon. And so what does that mean? We, we, we sort of stuck in a catch-22. It, it means that there needs to be innovation. Fundamentally, uh, it cannot be a copy-paste approach. Of, of bringing energy infrastructure into Africa because the, the tax base isn't there, therefore the giveaways aren't possible like, like occurred in America and Europe and, and the UK and elsewhere. Uh, and so that means we've got, to, we've got to innovate around lower cost energy infrastructure. Is it, it, it's no surprise that you're seeing things like microgrids and solar home systems uh, in, in Africa before you really saw them anywhere else because they're necessary innovations that lower the cost of solving some of these uh, access challenges. What we're building, are, you know, what we're rolling out and scaling, a renewable fuel utility, is not necessary in wealthy nations because wealthy nations had the giveaway infrastructure. We have to do it with commercial capital only because that's the capital that's available at scale, right? But it has to be fundamentally lower cost solutions that are built fit for purpose. And then similarly, when you're thinking about solving the affordability gap, if government subsidy is simply not an option because the governments don't really have the money because of the, you know, because of the demands on health, education, other things, right? then you have to find other ways to solve the affordability gap. And that's where carbon has a massive role to play. You know, carbon can fundamentally solve the affordability gap in a manner that historically was played by government giveaways in the wealthy nations. That's where I think the huge opportunity is to fund the rollout of sustainable infrastructure in a manner that is not giveaway programs, but is through effectively, you know, helping uh, Fortune 5000 companies decarbonize, right, and then using those revenue streams to solve the affordability gap, and then approaching, you know, fundamentally more lower cost infrastructure that, that has to be innovated and proved out in, in Africa rather than copy pasted from the, uh, the welfare state of the West. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. I think. Um your points resonate, and I think that affordability gap is a major issue. And this, essentially, the, the, the subsidies that have happened previously in the global north, it's not replicable here. So we need innovation. You're absolutely right. Um, we're going to try to bring on board um, our um, additional speaker, um, and I'm, we're going to see whether this works and whether the audience can hear them, and whether you can see him on the screen. Can you just wave out there if you can see 
Mr. Matuma Morango on the screen. No, so what I'm hoping is that you're going to be able to hear his voice uh, when we um, bring him in. So um, I'm going to take a big risk by giving him a big introduction and potentially having no one on the other line. But um, Matuma is the, uh, he's a member of the London Stock Exchange Africa Advisory Group and the lead on an initiative called the Sustainable Energy Initiative for Africa. Matuma has been a senior advisor to the government of Kenya's Ministry of Mining and Petroleum, and he's a long-term private investor and company director of Africa's largest deforestation company. Uh, his experience spans over 30 years across high, middle, and low carbon economies. Matuma, please tell me you can hear me, and if you can, can you give us a signal? So we can, I can see you on the screen here. Um, are you able to um, take on that question regarding challenges for financing? Can we pose that to you, Matuma? Okay. Right. So we have a sound problem. Matuma, hold your uh, responses. I'll come back to you. I think we, uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do in terms of the sound. So I think the first question that we asked here and all the responses you got from the panelists distinctly show that there is a challenge. But beyond that challenge of financing, there is capital available. It's what type of capital is available and where it's coming from that I'd like to ask the panel their next question or the next questions on. So I'm going to start this time with, uh, with Wally um, and ask you to just give us your perspectives on the sorts of capital that's available right now to finance renewable energy push across the continent. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Ibukun. Um, well, obviously working for a development finance institution, the development finance institutions like the African Development Bank have a very important role to play. Um, the AFDB is owned by all of the 54 African member states who contribute through the bank. What we're able to do is to multiply that financing several times. We can leverage because of the bank's AAA rating, we can go into the international capital markets and, and raise money at cheap rates for African countries. We also have donor funds that are available from um, uh, both regional and non-regional uh, countries. And that allows us to support the very poor countries through our Africa Development Fund we also have trust funds that are uh, contributed by various partners from the global north and also Asia. And so we can bring in co-financing. The, the bank is a trusted partner that uh, we're, we're present across the continent with offices in over 34 countries. And, and so we can go in with international investors who may be a little bit concerned around risk. Um, and risk is relative, by the way, you know. Uh, when we did uh, the Nigeria Power Sector privatization, I had the IFC, World Bank, all of these people. I was working for a commercial bank in Nigeria at the time, saying, where's the money going to come from? Who's going to invest in Nigeria? All this risk. In the end, we raised over $2.4 billion. 95% of that money was from Nigerians. So risk is very relative. If you went to school with the finance minister or the energy minister, you can call him. Again, somebody sitting in London or New York who's never met the guy. So you can manage certain risks by being on the ground. And that's why the local capital is also very important. You need local partners who understand the country and who understand the risk mitigants. So mobilizing the local private sector as well as governments is very important. And we also have uh, the local capital markets that we have to mobilize. And we've seen the growth of private equity funds. One of the key issues around developing projects in Africa is that we don't have enough institutional investors who are promoting projects. What tends to happen is that you have individuals promoting projects. And so you need to do due diligence on these indi the individuals and ascertain the source of their capital. Many of them are politically connected individuals, politically exposed, so you may not always be able to ascertain the source of their capital. Whereas if it's an institution, they have audited accounts, and so it's easier to deal with them. So what we have to do is multiply the sources of capital. I talked about savings earlier on. 
We have to mobilize institutional investors. We have to mobilize foreign investors to partner with the local institutions, and we have to create the right instruments that channel this capital into productive uses. Thank you, Wally. And um, I, I, I really hear you in terms of this, in particular, this trust versus truth here and diligence in capital that's coming in. It's a, it's a major challenge, but it's unfortunately a necessary, uh, shall we say, evil across the continent. But it's good to hear that domestic sources of funding are there. Um, I'm going to turn to Rami next um, with the same question. And, and Rami, obviously, as we talked about, capital markets is one source. Can you just elaborate for us in terms of the type of capital that's available across the continent? Okay. Everyone loves Africa. Everyone loves renewable. So I don't think the problem is the availability of funding. Okay. But it's about how to structure the funding on the best project offering and allow that proper access to finance. Uh, we have seen a lot of ESG funds coming online in, in, in the last two years, and they're chasing projects all over the world, and there is actually limited supply of proper projects that they want to invest in, so they start dumping higher numbers and bigger ticket sizes into certain projects that we think that it could have been lower, but again, it's because there is limited number of commercially feasible uh, projects. From a capital market perspective, definitely access to finance that provide the proper platform for capital raising for all their projects. But again, I will second here my colleague that we need to be a little bit creative in the type of repayment because the affordability factor in many of our countries is key. And we need to come up with certain solutions that would fit each country and uh, each society and each community. So again, carbon would be an, uh, an interesting source of uh, not only funding, of repayment on sometimes any. Uh, aside from capital markets, I was having a discussion yesterday with the regulator here that it would be interesting to start thinking of creating certain microfinance projects, allowing repayment with carbon credits arising or being issued from these projects, and then create a fund that would collect these uh, carbon credits, and you can trade them for the value at the end of the day. So I don't think there is a problem, again, into uh, funding. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of funding and everyone is announcing that we have zillions of dollars everywhere but again we have limited commercially feasible projects that would allow donors, private equity funds, development banks in order to fund these projects. So this is my two sentences on that point. And Rami just very quickly and we're in the host country in Egypt what sort of scale of capital is really available and really looking and focused on sustainability projects right now? If you were to just have a, an estimate on that in terms of the total AUM that's out there at the moment. If we're going to talk about specifically Egypt, it's going to be a very, very minimum number. And we do not see the appetite as we think that is going to uh, chase. Because most of the renewable projects has been funded directly by the state. And we're seeing some interest from sovereign funds in the region to start taking stakes into uh, these projects. And we are pushing for listing these projects on the capital markets. But still, yeah, Egypt is no, uh, is no foreigner from the entire African continent. We all share the same problem. We all share the same process. But maybe our government has took a, an appropriate step into restructuring the entire power uh, sector and giving priority funding for uh, this. We created in Bimban, in Aswan, south of Egypt, an interesting platform for solar uh, panels and solar, uh, uh, solar uh, supply for many companies to come in. And we have created the PPAs in place. And they've been supplying their energy to uh, the government. Again, you're going to fall into the point of the off-taker problem and the cash flow problem that you are funding in US dollars and you're collecting in EGP. All of that with the fluctuations in, in, uh, in currency. Then you have the collection problem from households to the off-takers. So there is a series of problems that are common throughout the continent. And I think for financiers to come in, they need the SPV that is being financed to properly structure in order to maintain it in a proper way. Thank you. And we'll come back to some of those points afterwards. Um, Mark, I'm going to come to you. I, before I met you, Mark, I was not necessarily convinced about the deep impact and role that philanthropy could have on this particular conundrum. And it'll be really great to hear your views on that and more broadly what types of capital 
what sort of funding sources are we going to see for this specific challenge in Africa? Okay, so I'm going to connect my comments to some of the other good comments by the panel. First, I'm the guy from New York who Wale was just talking about, who does not know the economic minister, didn't go to school with him, and is clueless, okay? And therefore has to partner with people like Wale who actually know the market. This is really important, that we have to identify people who really know what's going on in country and then put our capital side by side with those partners. There have been other comments by Rame and Greg. I won't go into those for, to try to answer your question. I think philanthropy can play a role as a multiplier on capital. The reason it has to play that role is that for whatever series of good historic reasons or bad historic reasons, Governments today around the world are not willing to do that. They're not willing to take the earliest stage risk at scale across Africa. It may be a lack of local capital markets. It may be that carbon markets haven't fully developed. It may be that aggregate capital markets, whether it's through stock exchange or others, have not realized the benefit of going deeper into the stack, lower in risk. But for whatever series of reasons, that's just the reality that we currently face. So this effort that I was describing earlier in my comment is meant to invest at the earliest stage of a project in partnership with a local partner, get it to a stage where it's financeable. So to make it simple, if you're talking about an energy project that takes three or four years to actually get ready to be financed, that's the time period during which this fund would operate, the earliest stage. Once it's ready to be financed, then, as, as Rame was saying, there is capital for a well-financed project, a well-structured project. It's not as much as we'd like, but there is some of that capital available. And what we want to do is have that party avoid the three or four year drag on both their returns and their time by focusing an effort just on that earliest stage. We would do that in partnership with folks like Wale and other institutions that are being developed and have, that exist in Africa. The only, comment, the only other comment I'd add is that when you think about this project, one of the reasons that large governmental institutions do not often take that earliest stage risk is because when they were established post-World War II, this wasn't the risk that they were trying to actually accommodate. They were looking to lend directly to sovereigns, not to projects. They were looking to have capital available to a sovereign credit, not to an individual risk-oriented institution or in in oriented company. So that's the reason it doesn't exist. Without having, you could talk more about what we, changes we should make in those institutions, but that would be another conversation. Thank you, Mark. Um, and that, that is a, the, those discussions and these points are critical. And the multiplier effect that you, re, you, you, rec you mentioned has the opportunity to really create a difference on the continent. So we're really looking forward to hearing more about the fund that you're, you're, you're running and then indeed more about how you're systematically approaching this problem. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to break um, proceedings just for two seconds to... Um, recognize um, a guest amongst our midst, and to recognize the, um, Mr. the Right Honorable Rael Odinga, um, the Africa Union High Representative for Infrastructure Development in Africa. Mr. Rael Odinga, please, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you with us, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, Mark, um, I'm going to come to you because I, I, I hope you don't mind. I left you out of the financing. Uh, sorry, Greg, apologies. I, I left you out of the financing um, piece purely because um, I wanted to get the views from, from, from the banks and the, and the other fund developers. But there's another source of potential financing or at least an accompaniment of financing across Africa. And that's the opportunity across voluntary carbon markets. 
And I know that this is something that Coco have been involved with in terms of developing projects that create these, these credits, for example. And I wanted to get a sense from you if you could just set the scene for us on what you think the near and long-term role is for voluntary carbon markets in supporting Africa's energy transition. Sure. Um, so if I go back to the theme of affordability, yeah, so the affordability gap is the challenge. Uh, giveaway infrastructure, like happened in the West, is, not, is difficult to finance because of the, the gap in the tax base. And so we need to lower the price of the energy, whether it's bioethanol cooking fuel that we retail, whether it's electrons, whatever the form of energy is, we need to lower the consumer price to enable it to be affordable. Uh, and there's two ways you can do that. You can innovate around three ways. You can innovate around technology to lower the cost. You can work with government in order to, uh, in order to remove the toll gate taxes that increase the prices. And I would like to formally acknowledge the support of uh, His Excellency Mr. Odinga uh, of the ethanol cooking fuel industry uh, in Kenya. Uh, which has uh, received VAT exemptions as a really po positive example for how we can level the playing field with, uh, with charcoal right? when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to the taxation levels to, to lower the retail price for the benefit of uh, Kenyan households. And then the third thing you can do, if there's not subsidy available because of the resource constraints, you can actually take revenue from abroad and give it to households, right? You can bundle the carbon revenue into the retail price, right, and actually use carbon in the place of government subsidy. So it's not called subsidy, it's called a discount. But where does the money come from? It comes from another revenue stream called carbon, right? And so there is an opportunity to uh, massively accelerate the rollout of a sustainable infrastructure uh, and, and using carbon as the forcing mechanism. You know, we are growing at over 10,000 households per week, right? We, we, we are scaling super rapidly and that is because of the strong support of the government of Kenya when it comes to leveling the playing field, because of our technology innovation and then because of carbon revenues, we are basically earning credits from compliance markets as well as voluntary markets and then giving those to households in the form of lower prices on their fuel, right? And that is a mechanism that can supercharge the scale at scale rollout of sustainable infrastructure uh, and, and, and I think is something that uh, ultimately is underutilized, um, but is a huge opportunity to solve the, solve the, the problem here. Thank you, Greg. Um, again, I think those points really, really resonate. There's no doubt that this voluntary carbon market opportunity is a big one. And I think um, lots of different studies have shown that this market will grow exponentially over the, over the near term. Um, and I know that um, Rami, you at EGX have recognize that potential and you have a number of initiatives that are in the pipeline in terms of how to utilize that to meet the financing challenges. Rami, would you be able to just give us some insights there from an EGX perspective? Sure. I wouldn't give you the full picture because we have another panel in like in an hour with the Prime Minister, so I invite everyone to come and listen for it. But I'll give you the highlights of carbon. The problem with carbon, it is a very, very interesting product, but at the end of the day you have several bottlenecks in the entire value chain. The first bottleneck is uh, the need for transparency when you trade carbon credits. Okay? The problem with African carbon credits today that are being deeply discounted in terms of pricing versus globally issued carbon credits because several factors. So you can see carbon credits issued from Europe and the Western world can go prices up to $15 per ton or $20 per ton, yet African credits are being sold at 3.5 or $4 per ton. So there's a lot to be taken into this value chain and it has to be unlocked. The entire value chain has to be disrupted. The main bottleneck that I see in the, is in the verification and the, in the validation process. It cannot scale at the current stage by any means. It cannot scale. So it has to be disrupted. Technology has to be utilized. Personally, I, I was just saying two days ago, carbon credits is going to be the new blockchain. It has to be disrupted one way or another in order to scale it and to actually provide and deliver financing to local communities and to the smaller communities in rural areas in Africa and in the entire world. In Egypt, we have taken on, in EGX, we're taking several steps in that regard. We have invested into a developing uh, arm in order to start helping projects issue their credits. However, this would require at least one year after 
getting or the project to issue the credit, it needs one year almost to become a tradable instrument because the verification and validation process is quite long, it's quite expensive, and it, it takes out the margin quite deeply, especially in Africa. Prices are not well positioned in African uh, credits. However, we will be creating a new platform that would allow African credits to start trading. Thus come the need for transparency and access to liquidity. Because today, several projects in Africa that do not have the knowledge, that do not have the transparency of pricing and access to investors, these credits are being sold at huge discounts. So the access for liquidity and access for transparency and integral uh, proposition is key for the success of trading carbon credits on the African continent. So this is how we determine the value chain of carbon credits in, in EGX, and we're trying to solve it here in Egypt in order to avail it for the entire continent as well. And it, we see it that because we're too fragmented, we're too many countries on this continent. We cannot do it each on its own. We all have to come together, we all have to cooperate, we all have to synchronize our regulations in order to accept these as uh, pan-African tradable instruments at the end of the day. So these are my two points as well on this. Thank you, Rami. And I think that call for collaboration to create an Africa-wide type platform is, is very important. But there are challenges, as you mentioned, around verification, around validation of the credits. Um, Mark, do you want to talk to us about some of the things that Three Cairns are looking at in terms of how some of these issues are, are potentially solvable in the Africa context and broadly, and more broadly? So, um, okay, credits, carbon credits. Total market globally, $2 billion. That's everywhere in the world, $2 billion. Okay, we spend about $120 billion on pet food globally. Okay, so $2 billion. I mean, we're just way not scaling carbon credits. This year, 2022, aggregate carbon credits are down year over year from 2021 to 2022. So I agree with Rami, it's not scaling. Yesterday, uh, Three Karens and, and Mike Bloomberg announced two things that we're trying to do that we think make sense, which is a fundamental change in carbon markets. Right now, and I, I won't go into the detail of this, although if you look on Bloomberg or our website, you can see the, more of the details of this. Anyway, right now, if you sell a credit to someone in Africa or buy a credit from someone in Africa, you're buying it permanently. You're buying the forest that is supposed to be holding carbon, and you buy it forever. We want to change that to buy it for a shorter period of time, five years or 10 years. There are two reasons to do this. One reason is then the party that owns the forest has an incentive to actually maintain the forest because they're going to sell it again in five years. If you own a building and you're going to rent it again, you make sure the roof doesn't leak because you want to rent it again. And it provides you a cash flow on an ongoing basis to improve the forest, for example, and improve the technology around it. And then lastly, just the last point on this would be, if you do something for five years, if Wale has a forest, I'm buying the credits of that forest, and I'm buying it for five years then it's possible Rame would say, okay, I trust that the forest is going to be there for five years. I'll ensure that payment. I'll be a third party who ensures both the validation of it and the underlying reality of it. The benefit of that is that if he's the insurance company, he's insuring lots of things. And if for some reason the forest isn't there, he can substitute one for another. What this does is it removes from me, the buyer, the responsibility to figure out if Wale's forest is real or not, okay? Somebody else is doing that as part of their business. And that's a, that's a core thing. What we're doing in carbon is trying to build something that no other commodity is required to do. I don't have to know my buyer or my seller if I'm buying corn or if I'm buying oil. I don't wanna have to know it if I'm buying carbon. If I do, it takes too long, which is what Rame was describing. Everything about verification that takes a year in Egypt is taking a year or more everywhere else in Africa. That is too long. You have to build an infrastructure that allows a plumbing 
that allows for the ease of the transaction to take place, which is what's taking place in all other commodity markets. Last point I would make is that in the commodity, I know I'm the buyer of a commodity. I have an incentive to know if it's any good. Why? Because I'm going to eat it if it's corn, or because I'm going to use it if it's fuel. But carbon, I have no incentive to know if it's any good, because I'm not going to eat it. And so there's a natural instinct for buyers not to be that concerned about the underlying situation, which is what leads to greenwashing, which is what leads to friction, and then capital markets don't want to participate. So those are some changes that we need to make. Happy to talk about that with anyone offline. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And um, I'm going to try again. I've just been told we might be able to have audio from Matuma. Um, Matuma, are you, can you maybe just give us a, a, a quick hello, maybe a testing, testing, one, two, three, see whether we can hear you? No, I think we still, still don't have uh, Matuma, but that's, that's, uh, that's okay. So we, um, I'd like to pose this same question to Wally in terms of, um, in terms of voluntary markets and credits. Wally, what's the bank thinking and what are you seeing more generally on the continent in that sense? Yeah, first of all, I should say what, what uh, Mark and the Three Curves Group is doing with uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies is very, very exciting and the bank is in full support of this initiative because I think that carbon represents the big opportunity that Africa needs in order to be able to scale its infrastructure. And you can link, link that to green hydrogen. The whole need for the world to decarbonize pre presents an opportunity for us to be able to develop clean energy. We have the space, we have the resources, we have the irradiation, we have the wind, and we are able to develop scalable, large-scale clean energy resources that will then help fund our own local infrastructure. Because if we're going to borrow in hard currency, we need hard currency revenues to service those loans. So you're going to match those risks. At the same time, we develop our own resources. So for us, we're very excited about the opportunity presented by the need for the world to decarbonize and certain number of countries in Africa are going to become green energy superpowers, you know, and that's where we're going. And, and for us, the bank is providing technical assistance because when our countries negotiate with foreign investors, we want them to negotiate on a level playing field. There's a lot of capacity we need to build in African countries. They don't want to give their resources away um, you know, freely or too cheap, and we don't want any side deals. Everything has to be transparent. We need the right governance around it. We need to mobilize investors, and we need to provide a partner that investors can trust. And again, this is where the bank comes in, where we can facilitate these investment flows, and we can monitor the investments to make sure that governments actually do what they promise to do. So for us, we're very excited, very supportive, very supportive of EGX. One of the bank's mandate is to deepen local capital markets and capital formation in Africa. And so all I'm saying is we want partners to come forward. We're very keen to work with everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Wally. And um, I'm just going to um, steal the floor for a few minutes just um, really to talk about one or two points that I know that was going to be raised by other panel members. And it, particularly around the voluntary carbon markets, there's a concept that um, we all know which is called carbon additionality. And that is on the basis that carbon credits can only be issued in a scenario where it is not business as usual. So if a bank is prepared to provide you with the financing, then ultimately that project is not additional. Now, this continues to cause us problems in Africa. And I say us as a very proud Nigerian here. We have issues that continue to blight the flow of capital like additionality. And one of the things that is core as we move forward as governments, as high profile speakers, as institutions, is we must look at the concept of additionality in Africa differently in their ability to turbocharge Africa's opportunity to meet its SDGs. SDG 10 on inequality, uh, SDGs around climate access, and growth. 
And the last point to make on this is that carbon offsets are not the only types of carbon credits available. There are also other instruments such as IREX and, and other energy attributable certificates that can all form part of this broader ecosystem that we're seeking to develop around the voluntary carbon markets. Um, I think these responses today have been absolutely amazing, but I want to come away for a few minutes just to try and see if we've got any questions directly from the audience um, to any of the panel members. I can see one, two hands up already. We're going to probably take about four questions. That's all we have time for. Rami has an appointment with the, uh, with, with the president, so we can't keep him too long. Um, so if, you could, um, if I could start over here with this question. Could we get a mic over there, please? Please, could you um, state your name and your uh, and also your um, your institution as well? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Elona Irezi from Nigeria. I'm a management consultant uh, with Sidani Group. So um, I, I joined quite late, so I'm just going to ask my questions and hope they've been answered. If not, yeah, I will be happy to receive one. Um, so we were talking about yesterday in a conversation with Madam Ungazi Okonjo Weller. Um, the World Trade Organization is working on a global carbon pricing framework. I don't know if Africa is already tapping into that. Uh, uh, we have 54 countries in Africa, and that is already t uh, too fragmented when it talks about uh, carbon pricing regimes across Africa. Uh, I don't know, like I said, if it's been discussed, if Africa is tapping into the global carbon pricing framework. Um, uh, this conversation is still this conversation is still at the basic level at the WTO and this would be a very good time for Africa to tap into that. So um, that is one. Okay. Secondly uh, Sorry, we're going to have to keep it to one question if you don't mind, if that's okay. Uh, so um, just so we've heard your question correctly, you're talking about carbon pricing frameworks. Yeah? Okay. All right. More broadly. Um, Greg, do you want... Do you, yeah, we'll take, a, we'll take a few, actually. Okay. Um, that's the first one. Um, I think there was a hand up here first, and then this gentleman here. Um, this lady in the pink dress, please, and then the gentleman here. Hi. I'm Perrin Toledano from Columbia University in New York. Um, I love this idea of carbon credit as an opportunity for uh, private finance for Africa, but uh, it, it, is, it is interpreted now as a license to pollute for the global north, in particular when the credits are so cheap in Africa as you explained. So how do you... What okay, is thank you, thank you. Um, this gentleman just here, and then we'll have one more, the gentleman at the back here by the mic by the camera. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's good to see you, Ibukun. Um, panelists, good morning, everyone. My name is Mugwe Manga. I am a co-founder and managing director of Olsuswe Energy, a geothermal development company in Kenya. My question is around risk. I think what is clear is the perceived risk of Africa is extremely high vis-a-vis -vis the real risk. What can we do to reduce the perceived risk. Thank you. Thank you, Mugwe. Um, the gentleman in the white by the camera here, and then I think we'll probably have to do that because you'll need to go, okay? Right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm representing Catholic Relief Services for Madagascar here. Um, Back to the initial challenges that uh, African countries are uh, in terms of um, renewable energies. So we were talking about initial investments, but the main challenges in Africa are in relation to operation and maintenance and linked to the fact that the costs and the local currency doesn't work uh, for the investment. Uh, would it be possible to have some information of potential funds in relation to operation and maintenance of renewable energy? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then just the very final one, this gentleman here in the front, and then that will have to be it, I'm afraid, because of time. 
Good morning. Je suis M. Coutois, secteur privé. Euh, J'ai 100 dollars et je voudrais investir dans les énergies renouvelables, dans les pays africains. Comment je fais okay. J'ai 100 dollars, je veux investir dans les pays africains. Je veux investir par exemple dans la biomasse au Kenya, je veux investir dans un autre pays, comment je fais Obligation. Comment je fais He is saying that he has 100 dollars and he wants to invest that in renewable projects in Africa. How can he do that Okay. Merci, monsieur. I can do that bit. Okay. Um, right. So, uh, we have five questions and we've got uh, approximately 10 minutes to get through them. Rami, I'm going to come to you first on the question of carbon pricing from the lady here, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Carbon pricing framework. So, Africa is doing many things when it comes to carbon. Yesterday we have launched with ACME, the African Carbon Markets Initiative, and we're looking into, uh, into that and the entire value chain is being studied as well. But if we're talking about a specific framework for pricing, no, it has to be liberal to the market. They have to uh, price the credits according to the supply and demand at the end of the day. However, there is different pricing upon the quality of the project itself and maybe it's some sort of sectoral analysis as well. Uh, we have to focus what, which sector is producing this uh, carbon and you have to quantify the emissions. So yes, African countries are coming together to study the entire market initiative. And pricing is definitely one angle of it. And as I told you, we, we have put on the agenda that is being deeply discounted versus global uh, issued c credits. And we're trying to push to change that gap as well. OK. Does anyone want to come in on that one? Greg? Yeah, the, the first two questions were similar. Um, last year, $851 billion was transacted in global carbon markets, of which two was in the voluntary, right? So two is this tiny little thing over in the corner. 849 is in compliance markets. The guys over in the negotiating hall are trying to figure out the API to knit together global carbon prices. We don't have a problem with the carbon price in Europe. It's 80 to to $100 a tonne. To your, to your question, the problem is low prices. The problem is not emissions trading as a system to decarbonize an economy. The problem is not the, the concept of buying and selling carbon. The, the problem is a, is a low price. And so this is exactly what the World Trade Organization uh, boss, uh, Ngozi, is trying to solve for with a global minimum floor price that actually increases over time. That is the answer to solve all of these problems. The challenge around greenwashing is that companies in the voluntary market are voluntarily taxing themselves to tell stories, and they're doing that at a very low rate. Whereas if regulation comes in via compliance markets that knit themselves together, right, then you have a very high price signal, particularly if you can, you can set a floor price under it. That is the, the medium term answer. Difficult in places like the United States or Australia, which have more toxic domestic climate politics around emissions trading, not so difficult in the Europe, Europe or the UK or other, other uh, nations. Korea, Japan is introducing carbon pricing. So there are 34 emissions trading schemes already in operation around the world. What we need to do is see more of them. We need to see them knit together. And we need a hard price on carbon that increases over time. And then I think, I think your challenges uh, will be solved for in that in that scenario. Okay. Wally, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Greg. very quickly. I think many of us are familiar with the concept of economic man. Humans are economic beings. Unless you provide a commercial incentive for people to stop uh, emitting carbon, it's not going to happen. You're not going to appeal to their good sense. That's why we have to get the carbon market right. When you look at the carbon uh, border adjustment tax that the the, that Europe is going to introduce. It says if you have carbon anywhere in your value chain, you're going to be penalized for that. So you're going to have uh, industries looking for green value chains. Where can we create the green value chains? In areas of the world where you don't have any value chain whatsoever. Africa is very well poised, so they're not going to keep emitting. They're going to shift to new forms of production that will uh, um, do away with carbon in the value chain. So for me, I think that answers the question around are you encouraging people to keep emitting? The regulations have to be in place globally and that's why we're here. Thank you. Um, 
Mark, do you want to have a go? We're, all, we're answering the two questions there, it sounds like, on carbon pricing and this license for Global North to take advantage of the cheap price in, in, in Africa. Do you want to give us some comments on that from these two questions? I agree with what Greg and Wale just said, so I'm not going to get back into that. Uh, on the voluntary carbon markets, I tried to describe the changes that I think are necessary to increase the quality of those credits. So I guess I'm, I'm good with that. We can move to another one. Okay, very good. Um, why don't we chat, take on uh, Mugwe's question next, which is the question of risk in Africa and how we can mitigate. And I know there were a couple of uh, responses to that, Wale, but maybe you want to expand somewhat on that for Mugwe's questions. Yeah, risk is about information. You know, knowledge is power. When I first started my job, um, one of the things I'm responsible for is regulation, policy, statistics, and knowledge. And I found that if you want to find out anything about the energy sector in Africa, you have to go to databases managed by others, whether it's the World Bank or IEA or some other institution. None of those institutions were African. So it means that we have to get information out there. This is why we created the Africa Energy Portal, where you go, each country has a page where you have information about the energy sector, who the regulators are, who the utilities are, uh, the energy access rates. We have to get our story out there, because if we don't tell the story and let others tell our story, then you're going to have this risk perception. But when we start telling our own stories, most people listen to Afrobeats from Nigeria these days, right? That's because we stopped buying uh, music from, from the US and other places. We're telling our own story and people like that story. And, and that's why what we need to do. That's how you're going to get rid of the risk perception. And Africans have to invest in Africa. When you see Aliko Dangote investing $19 billion in a refinery in his own country, Others are going to come in. I don't want a foreign, I want a foreigner to come and invest that amount, but if I don't see locals doing it, I'm not going to do it. So that, answer, to me, answers that question. Thank you. Anyone else want to have a go on the risk question? Yeah, I'd echo that, local capital. Um, we have a, a, a really wide range of uh, private investors from East, Eastern, Southern, Western Africa, and they have given comfort to our foreign investors because our foreign investors are fundamentally context dumb. Nice people, very smart people, but context dumb. They don't understand the context in the way that the local investors do. So the crowding in effect that our local investors have enabled for foreign capital has been really, really substantial. So I, I, you know, I'd recommend for folks building uh, companies in Africa that uh, along that journey you make an extra effort to bring in the local capital, which does exist. It's not scarce. Okay. I've agreed with 99% of what Wale said, okay, and I, maybe 100. But I think the one thing that's worth considering on risk is if I look at every private equity firm in Africa, which I've spent the last year looking at, the returns are not as good, okay? So they're not as good as the West. What does that mean? That means if you have a dollar, where do you want to invest it, okay? And why is it a little bit, why are the returns lower? There's a whole series of reasons that Wale has tried to elaborate on, including foreign exchange, which is a core, core, core issue. The one thing that I think we might want to think about is why does it take so long to build something in certain countries, okay? It does in the United States as well. It takes a long time to get something built. If we're only able to build things over a long period of time, and if change takes place during that period of time so that investors have a change of government or a change of policy or a change of reality, and then they think, okay, I could go build it somewhere else faster, that's a fundamental problem, okay? We have to okay. think about that fundamental problem because time is risk, time is money, and that's how people think about it. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I believe we've now got some audio from, um, from Nairobi, from Mutuma. So we're going to go, try to go to him. So, um, Monsieur, pardon, uh, we'll come to your question if we have some time at the end. Um, Mutuma, do you want to just give us, I think at this point, just some general comments? We're hoping we can hear you loud and clear now. But the floor is yours, Mutuma. Thank you.
ask him to unmute his mic. Uh, can you unmute your mic, Matuma? He's frozen. Is he blinking? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, apologies. This is uh, technology at its highest level today. So um, I think what we will... He's muted. Matuma, can you unmute yourself? So um, in the meantime, Rami, would you... Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you be willing to tell this gentleman how he should spend $100 uh, on carbon-related projects um, whilst we're waiting for Matsuma to come through? Very easy. Wait for our change to come online and come invest. Trade on our platform and you'll get your money back. That's the easiest <laughs> thing. <laughs> Thank you, Rami. Very good. Um, just to add to that, that uh, the African Development Bank has a number of different instruments. You'll need a bit more than $100, but you're welcome to put money in one of our trust funds and we can invest it for you and multiply the impact. So um, let's have a discussion. Very good. So um, we didn't catch the question from the gentleman from Madagascar, so if we could pose that again. Then we'll take that final question. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, in the initial challenges, we're talking about initial investment. While the most challenging aspect of renewable energy in Africa is the operation maintenance. Um, so how can we uh, ensure that there's finance as well for those aspects uh, apart from the in initial investment? Thank you. Take that one, Wally. The issue around operational maintenance of infrastructure is not limited to Africa. It's a problem we have gro globally because banks do not, uh, no, governments do not look at the whole life cost of developing infrastructure. They budget on an annual basis, and sometimes there's no money to do maintenance. So you, that's why you do PPPs, you bring in the private sector, you award a concession. And over time, you factor in the whole life cost of maintenance into the, the, the original capital that you're raising. So governments have different ways of incentivizing the whole life cost, but it's not limited to Africa. You have to provide the right contractual incentives to allow maintenance to form part of the, you know, the fundraising at the beginning. Excellent. Okay. And um, ladies and gentlemen, we're nearly rounding up now. Thank you very much for those excellent questions, by the way. And I know there may be others. So do feel free to catch the guests a little bit later. Um, gentlemen, we have, and by the way, we don't have enough ladies on this panel, by the way. So we'll need to do something about that moving forward. I have to su suggest that. Um, can I ask you each, and I mean it, to be extraordinarily, extraordinarily succinct and give me a one-minute summary of your final views on this opportunity and challenge across Africa. Mark. I've had a chance uh, in a short time, so as I said earlier, I don't know enough about Africa, but I spent the last year traveling and trying to understand it more deeply. I would say one thing, there are a number of people who do know. My friend to the left here is one of those people. I look at the, at the institutions of Africa and say, there are a whole series of new initiatives that are really to the positive. We more or less know what the challenge is. And if you listen to a couple of the people on this panel, those challenges just need to be acted upon. Thank you. Wally? Yeah. Um, well, to summarize, I think we have a number of key factors that are working in Africa's favor right now, and we need to take advantage of it. You know, there's a fast, uh, rapid economic growth in a lot of African countries. We have the youngest populations. By 2040, the population of Africa will double. Uh, Africa is industrializing. There's the opportunity to industrialize in a sustainable manner. And we have the opportunity to also play a critical role in the world's transition to net zero. And so we cannot miss the opportunity. The one thing we have to do is around governance. In, in Africa, we have to get our leaders to understand this opportunity and not um, uh, let down the uh, aspirations of our young people. 
because all these young people are going to need jobs. So there's the opportunity to really take the bull by the horn and create the environment to allow them to thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Greg? Uh, in summary, I'd, I'd, I'd probably focus on innovation. You know, the, the rollout of the infrastructure in Africa is going to look different than the, the way that it occurred uh, in the global north. Uh, we need innovative, innovative approaches to technology, to infrastructure, uh, to policy, uh, and to finance. There is a huge opportunity for Africa to be a major supplier, exporter in hard currency of, uh, of carbon offsets to regulated and voluntary markets around the world, and to use that revenue right, to fund the rollout of sustainable infrastructure, to fund the building of new green industries, to fund the protection and conservation of nature. This is not an opportunity that existed uh, in, the, in the giveaway welfare infra rollout that occurred in America or Australia, right? This is something that's unique to Africa because, because the world is starting to value uh, African natural resources, uh, forests, uh, uh, you know, in a way that has, historically hasn't been done. And so let's take advantage of this moment Let's take advantage of the constraints on, on, on public resources and find a way to use these innovations in technology, infrastructure, and financing to uh, build out uh, stuff that's going to look fit for purpose uh, in this century versus copy-pasting the approaches from last. Thank you, Greg. And uh, Rami, um, your guests have very kindly left you about 15 seconds. Uh, no, my apologies. Please go ahead. I'll be quite short. <laughs> Let's all come together. Let's create our own super supply power globally. Let's try to synchronize our regulations. Let's stay on the table as a unified front in order to appropriately price our carbon credits. This is going to be our new resource to the world. Let's preserve it and let's maintain it. Less Excellent. than 15 seconds. Thank you very much. In 15 seconds, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Indeed.